and the Holy Spirit are so wonderful. He's wonderful to each and every one of us. My brothers and sisters, I'm excited about the message on this morning from the gospel as recorded by St. Luke. St. Luke, the 24th chapter, verses 30 through 35. And I'll be reading from the New King James Version of the Bible. Now it came to pass, as he sat at the table with them, that he took bread, blessed, and broke it, and gave it to them, and their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished from their sight. And they said one to another, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road? and while he opened the scriptures to us. So they arose, they rose up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven and those with them gathered together, saying, The Lord is risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. And they told about the things that had happened to them on the road and how he was known to them of bread. And I want to talk to you this morning from this thought. He lives. He lives. Jesus is alive and well. Yes, our Savior lives. There, there is a great hymn of the church that bears the name He Lives. This hymn is sung about the risen Savior, Jesus Christ. And unlike Buddha, unlike Muhammad, and unlike Confucius, our Savior died, but he got up. That is, he rose again. And now he sits on the right hand of his heavenly Father in glory. Listen, if you will, to the first stanza of this great hymn, He Lives. The hymn writer says, I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that He is living, whatever men may say. I see His hand of mercy. I hear His voice of cheer. And just the time I need Him, He's always near. He lives. He lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives. He lives. Salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Two men in the Gospel of St. Luke, the 24th chapter, starting at the 13th verse. Two men were traveling together on their way to a town called Emmaus, which was located seven miles outside of the city of Jerusalem. This is one of the most beloved accounts of the resurrection story recorded in the Bible. It is an account of the risen Savior helping two ordinary persons who had lost hope and had fallen into the pit of despair and sadness. Their hope that Jesus was the promised Messiah had been devastated, dashed against the rocks of death. But in their despair, their thoughts were rushing wildly about a tangle wondering about the report of the women who had gone early to the tomb on Sunday morning to find the tomb empty. And they came back and gave a report that even though the tomb was empty, they encountered two angels who said to them that Jesus was alive. To these two travelers, they were trying to figure out what did all of this mean. While these two men were discussing the events that had recently happened in Jerusalem, 
Jesus himself drew near to them. And he walked with them. And verse 16 of Luke 24 says, But their eyes were restrained, so that they did not know or recognize him. My brothers and sisters, I want you to understand that a supernatural cause was behind their inability to recognize who Jesus was. Just as a supernatural enabling in a short few verses would enable them to see Jesus and recognize him as the risen Savior. Every time I read this passage of scripture, my mind goes back to Elisha's servant, Gehazi, in 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 15 and 16. In this account, the king of Syria had made war against Israel. And every time the king of Syria would send his army out to ambush the Israelites, Elisha the prophet would warn the king of Israel so that the king of Syria ambush was foiled. So the king of Syria wanted to know from his servants which one of us is a spy for the king of Israel. And one of his servants let him know that no one in the camp was a spy, but the prophet Elisha would tell the king of Israel whatever the king was plotting against his king. So he sent men, part of his army, at night to find Elijah and to bring him back. 2 Kings 6, verses 15 through 17 states, And when the servant of the man of God rose early and went out, there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. And his servant said to him, that is Gehazi, said to Elisha, Alas, my master, what shall we do? So Elisha answered, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Now the only thing Gehazi could see was the Syrian army having the city surrounded. And he knew that there was no escape for the two of them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes, talking about Gehazi's eyes, so that he may see. Gehazi was looking through the natural eye. He could only see the enemy soldiers. But Elisha was looking through the eyes of God. And God answered Elijah's prayer, and he opened the spiritual sight of Gehazi. And Gehazi looked, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elijah. My brothers and sisters, I'm here to tell you that the same way God dispatched his angels yeah. to protect Elijah, yeah. God will dispatch his angels to protect you and me. <laughs> Now in this 17th chapter, or uh, 17th verse of Luke 24, it says, Jesus opened, he drew near and opened the conversation with the two disciples by asking them what had they been discussing along the way. From this, we know that Jesus had walked silently behind these two men while they were carrying on their conversation. It was evident in their facial expression and perhaps even in the way that they walked that they were sad about the events that had taken place. So in this hymn, He Lives, stanza number two says, In all the world around me I see His loving care and though my heart grows weary I will never despair. I know that he is leading through all the stormy blasts. The day of his appearing will come at last. He lives. He lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, New Hope. He lives. Salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. I know he lives because he lives 
within my heart. In verses, St. Luke 24, verses 25 through 27, Jesus makes the Bible, the scriptures, come alive for these two disciples. The word says, he expounded to them about the suffering of the Messiah. This word expounded means that he let the scriptures speak for themselves. He stuck close to the, to the text. He didn't use fancy allegories or speculative ideas concerning himself. I believe that Jesus told them that the Messiah was the seed of the woman whose heel was bruised. I believe that Jesus told them that the Messiah was the blessing of Abraham to all nations. I believe that Jesus told them that the Messiah was the high priest after the order of Melchizedek. I believe that Jesus told them that the Messiah was the man who wrestled with Jacob to the break of dawn. I believe that Jesus told them that the Messiah was a lion of the tribe of Judah. I believe that Jesus told them that the Messiah was a voice that spoke to Moses coming out of the burning bush. I believe that Jesus told them that the Messiah was the Passover lamb. I believe that Jesus told them that the Messiah was the prophet that was greater than Moses. I believe that Jesus told them that the Messiah was the king of the Lord's army to Joshua. Yes, I believe that Jesus told them that the Messiah was the ultimate kingsman redeemer mentioned in the book of Ruth. Yes, I believe that Jesus told them that the Messiah was the son of David who was greater than King David. Yes, I believe that Jesus told them that the Messiah was the suffering savior of Psalms 22. Yeah. I believe that Jesus told them that the Messiah was the good shepherd in Psalms 23. Well, yeah. I believe that Jesus told them that the Messiah was the wisdom of Proverbs and the lover of the Song of Solomon. Yes, I believe that Jesus told them that the Messiah, that the Messiah was the lily of the valley yes. and the bright and morning star. Yeah. I believe that Jesus told them that the Messiah was the Savior described in the prophets and the suffering servant of Isaiah 53. I believe that Jesus told them that the Messiah was the priestly Messiah of the book of Daniel uh -huh. who would establish a kingdom that would last forever, uh -huh. that would never end. I believe that after Jesus expounded to them that the disciples wanted to hear more. So in verses 28 through 31, it says that the two disciples wanted to hear more from Jesus, so they invited him to come and stay a little while longer. Yeah. Why would these two men, or Jesus rather, would have gone on his way if the two men had not invited him to stay? How do I know he would have gone? Because Jesus never enters a life or a home without a personal invitation. The two were seeking the truth. So they wanted Jesus to enter their home and share more of the scriptures with them. The expression, their eyes were open, should not be understood. It should be rather understood that God opened their spiritual understanding. Now the purpose of Jesus appearing to these two disciples on the road to Emmaus was complete. So Jesus disappeared from their sight. This disappearance is not a disappearance in the natural sense that Jesus just got up and simply walked out of the house. But no, rather this disappearance means that Jesus suddenly disappeared out of their sight. Jesus no longer was regulated by space and time after the crucifixion and resurrection. Jesus got up out of that grave with a glorified body. Uh -huh. That's why the Gospel of Luke 24, 39 says, when the disciples were in the upper room with the door shut and locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus appeared right in their midst. Luke 24, 39 says, Jesus said to them, behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me 
and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. Notice in this glorified body, there is the absence in the Bible of blood. He doesn't have a flesh, blood, and bone body, but he says, handle me. For a phantom or a ghost doesn't have a flesh and bone body. Matthew 7, 7 and 8 says, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone, for everyone. Jesus doesn't play favorites. Well, he'll do some things for some people and not for others. But it says, for everyone who asks, receives. And he who seeks, shall find. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. When was the last time Jesus opened some doors that was closed in your face? Uh, the same Jesus, the very same Jesus and not another. If you call on him and you call him in, in sincerity and in truth, Jesus will open doors for you that man has closed. Revelation 3.20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and make my home with him. Holman, William Holman Hunt, a famous painter, painted a picture. Years ago, a lot of people used to have this paint, uh, a replica of this painting hanging up in their homes where Jesus is standing up, knocking on a physical door. And Holman Hunt said in that painting, he left something out of it on purpose. If you were to look at that painting, you would see a doorknob on the inside of the door. There's no doorknob on the outside. Depicted in Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door of your heart and knock. And he won't force his way in. But he says, if you will open the door to your heart and allow him to come in, he'll come in and dine with you. And Jesus says, once he come in, I will never leave you, nor will I ever forsake you. Matthew 18, 20 says, For where there are two or three yeah. gathered together in my name, he promised there I will be in the midst. Now, the two men, after hearing Jesus and Jesus now disappearing from them, they carry on their conversation between the two of them. And they said one to another, Did not our heart, did not our heart burn within us? while he spoke with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us. Notice what they said. Did not our heart burn within us? They were saying, in other words, this scripture saying, it's not a head problem. It's not a head problem when we don't accept Christ. It's not a head problem when we don't do what is right. This thing started in the heart. Jesus says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So he said, did not our heart burn within us. Jeremiah chapter 20, verses 7 through 9. Jeremiah says, O oh Lord, you induced me, and I was persuaded. You are stronger than I, and have prevailed. I am in the rising daily. Everyone mocks me. For when I spoke, I cried out, I shouted violence and, and plunder. Because your word Lord was made a reproach to me and a derision daily. Then I said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name. Jeremiah got upset because everyone made fun of him when he went out and spoke the word of God. He made, they made such fun of Jeremiah. He became such a mockery that he said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name. I believe that Jeremiah went home and took a seat. Mm -hmm. But the more he sat down, the more, the more the word of God bubbled up on the inside. Yes, so Jeremiah says, but his word uh -huh. was in my heart yes. like a burning fire yes. shot up in my bones. I was weary with holding it in mm. and could not. Have you ever had God to do something for you. Wow. And you said you wasn't going to tell nobody. Come on now. But you just couldn't keep it to yourself. Yes, sir. Did yes. Jesus touch your body yes, sir. and heal your sick body? Yeah. 
when the doctor said that there was nothing that they could do. Yeah. But then Jesus, Mary's baby, yeah. the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star stepped in. And Jesus, the master physician, yeah. that has never lost a patient, yeah. started working in your behalf. Yeah. These two disciples, after that word started burning in their heart, mm -hmm. they had just left Jerusalem, a seven mile journey. They made their way back to Jerusalem and found the apostles and the other disciples already gathered. They listened as Simon Peter was telling of his experience with the risen Savior. Can't you just imagine these two men, Cleophas and the other gentleman that was traveling with him, how they're just bubbling up on the inside, waiting on Peter to finish telling his story so that they can tell of their, 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 their uh, Emmaus Road experience that they had with the Messiah. The third stanza, and I'm finished, the third stanza of the song, He Lives, says, mm -hmm. Rejoice, rejoice, O Christians. Yep. Lift up your voice and sing. Eternal hallelujahs to Jesus Christ, the King, the hope of all who seek Him, the help of all who find. No other is so loving, so good and kind. He lives. He lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives. He lives. He lives. He lives. And you ask me how I know he lives. I don't know about you. If you ask me how do I know yeah. I've had my personal experience with him. I know that he lives yeah. because he lives within my heart. Yeah. Does he live within your heart on today? Have you made Jesus your choice? My brothers and sisters, Jesus, Mary's baby, the precious Lamb of God, he is alive. He is alive and well. You need to call on him. You can call on him right now. You'll never get a busy seat. So if you haven't accepted Jesus and made him your choice today, would you call on him right now? The word says, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, you shall be saved. Eternal salvation is yours for the asking. Is that one on today? I'll praise you. We'll close this out. Hold those horns for the praise team.